Good evening. Um, I welcome everybody who is viewing tonight and is with us in our Zoom room. I'll now call the February 3rd, 2021 work session of the Lane Community College Board of Education meeting to order. In recognition of Governor Kate Brown's Stay Home Save Lives executive order to combat the spread of COVID-19, this meeting is being held remotely. Um, I'd like to remind board members and staff to keep themselves muted and to use the hand raise feature when you would like to speak. Um, board members are also asked to have their video turned on so we are visible to the viewing public. Donna, could you take the roll, please? Sure. Angela Van Kraus. Present. Mike Eister. Here. Matt Keating. Here. Chelsea Jennings. Here. Rosie Pryor. Here. And Lisa Fragola. Present. Um, and as is our custom, we will start our meeting with an acknowledgement of Homeland. And tonight, Richard Plott is going to read that for us. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Chair Fragola. I'd like to start our meeting with acknowledgement that the land we are on is the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya people. The Kalapuya were stewards of this very land for over 14,000 years before their traditional way of life was forever disrupted and destroyed. We start our meeting with humility and reverence for the original inhabitants, the Kalapuya. Great. So we have um, a pretty reasonable agenda for one of our meetings, which sometimes get a little full. And we're going to start tonight with our um, safe reopening plan implementation update from Provost Jarrell. Thank you, Chair Fragola, for that. I'm having um, Chrome problems, Google problems here, but I think I can, can you hear me or see me? We can both see. We're good. Okay, great. Thank you. So my my apologize. Uh, my apologies for that. Um, so with regard to to uh, reopening, we have no changes in the um, uh, reopening plan, the institutional reopening plan. We did have uh, uh, one uh, departmental plan uh, that was submitted and approved through cabinet for the Lane County Sheriff's Academy uh, Reserve uh, Training Academy. So that's the update. There we're still holding steady uh, with the same number of uh, cumulative cases that we've had in the past with COVID as I reported last time. And some other interesting news, uh, we have been actively participating the campus in vaccination clinics. Um, uh, we did have uh, uh, a clinic uh, on campus um, uh, last week and the first part of this week uh, and plans to have additional ones this coming weekend. So, so it's a lot of activity and it feels good to be part of that solution. If you have any particular questions about that, I believe we do have Laura Green on and she could, could uh, address that as she's been managing a lot of that with Don Barth for us. So that's my report. Are there any questions from board members? Matt Keating? Yeah, that's gr great to hear about the vaccination clinic partnership with Lane County Health. Um, and I wanted to know if there's any need for volunteers to help guide traffic or is, is or or and or do you need anything from the board? Um, and what's the staffing uh, component um, of, of that those vaccination clinics look like? Yeah, I think the answer to that question is yes, but I'll let Laura, I see it's on here if you might want to speak a little bit more specifically to that, Laura? Sure, good evening all. Um, let's see, for this coming weekend, I think we are covered for volunteers, but um, if we keep putting these on, we probably will need to get some more volunteers. For this past week and this coming weekend, um, we are relying heavily on our CERT team and they have been wonderful to work with. And this weekend, because who we will be targeting are childcare providers and early childhood education um, providers. The volunteers will be both our CERT team as well as people that work in the childcare center. Great, thank you, Laura. Is there, are there any other questions for Paul or Laura? 
Okay, I, I too am, am really pleased that we're able to provide that service to the community. So thank you so much. And um, for those people working on it, it seems like we may begin to see in, increased numbers of vaccines coming into Lane County. So it, it's great to see that service being ramped up. So I am gonna move us on to our mental health and wellness center report. Um, Provost Jarrell is going to be speaking about that as well as um, Terry Miner, who's the Associate Dean of Title IX and the Mental Health and Wellness Center and Laura Green, who we just heard from, who's the Interim Health Clinic Director. Great, well, thank you for that. And again, my apologies for being a little bit uh, uh, frazzled here trying to arrange for some technical issues. Um, so I appreciate uh, uh, your, the ability to talk about our efforts. Uh, as you know, we've been really trying to address uh, the growing mental health and wellness needs of our students. Uh, with the development of the Mental Health and Wellness Center uh, and the transition now of our health clinic away from uh, more of a primary care sent service to staff and students to a student-only health and wellness uh, center, we're working to merge some of these uh, services and create a more holistic integrated student health and wellness center. Um, the primary goal of this discussion that we want to have today with you is to focus on the efforts to address mental health needs of our students. I did want to briefly mention some of the changes that are occurring uh, in addressing physical health of our students as well. Um, as you know, with the Affordable Care Act um, provided a lot more insurance to many of our students that previously were uninsured. We've also had a reduction in clinic staff uh, in the physical health, uh, uh, the student health clinic or the health clinic at that point. And so the clinic is shifting away from that kind of primary care model more towards serving uh, uh, as a uh, access to provide access to uh, health care for short-term illnesses and population-specific health needs, in particular treatment of illnesses such as allergies, colds, sore throats, things like that, minor energies, uh, sexual health services, preventative health care, and then also then serving as a referral uh, agent for primary care providers and specialists. So, so that's some of the changes there, and we can talk more about those at a later date, but what we want to focus on here is really how we're addressing the mental health needs in that integrated model there. Um, so we hope to provide you with uh, uh, opportunity for dialogue, uh, conversation as we get uh, moving through this uh, presentation. Uh, I've asked Terry Menner uh, to, to serve as the shepherd of this conversation. Uh, and we'll also have Laura Green and myself uh, on, on here if you have any questions for that. So with that, I'll introduce Terry Menner, our Associate Dean of the Mental Health and Wellness Center in Title IX. And of course, you've already met Laura Green, our Director of the Student Health Clinic. So Terry. Well, thank you. I'm gonna share the screen if I may. Um, so you can follow along with me on the PowerPoint. All right. Are you able to see the screen? Yes, we are. Oh, great. Well, good evening and thank you, Board of Education, President Hamilton and Provost uh, Vice President Gerald and the guests. Um, thank you for inviting the Mental Health and Wellness Center and the Health Clinic to come and present this evening. We uh, broke this presentation into, all right, I'm having just a little trouble moving the slide. Okay, technology here. Okay. All right, there we go. Thanks for your patience. So uh, we broke this presentation into a, a four sections to talk to you about a lot of information, but we're trying to break it down into an outline form. And uh, what we wanted to talk to you about is the current mental health trends and to really understand mental health impact of LCC students. Uh, let me speak first about uh, uh, mental health, not only nationally, but uh, our state, county as well. The following <clears throat> slides will provide you with a glance of how mental health needs have significantly increased. In the 1980s, students were asked to leave the campus uh, when they suffered from se severe mental health issues. Today, we work closely with them to provide treatment and resources so they can continue to have access to their education. 
According to APA, which is the American Psychological Association and the National Alliance on Mental Health Illness, uh, students have reported feeling hopeless, feeling overwhelmed, feeling lonely, and engaged in abnormal, reckless behaviors. Most importantly here that I would point out I missed the slide, sorry. Most importantly here that I would point out is that 67%, that draws me, my attention. 60% of students don't seek treatment. So the holistic approach is gonna be critical here. So when we look at our uh, overall trends, when we look at it, over 50% we see an increase in adolescents and our youth experiencing increased depression and suicide ideation. That's important to us because many of Lane's youth attend Lane Community College. Um, I would bring us a little bit closer to home. In Oregon, uh, suicide rate is over 40% higher than the national average, according to the CDC. Very important. And when we bring it even closer to us, when we're talking about Eugene and Lane County, we know that so far this year, in 2021, there were 28 suicide intervention calls that were too dangerous for other community resources. So when uh, we look at how we can support our students, you might even say, how did COVID impact our students? And what happened is in about September, university and community colleges it, uh, uh, presidents were surveyed and they asked them, what were the high priorities? What were things that they were concerned about during the COVID and the remote learning? And now we found that from that in the September, um, it, that, that it was a, a high concern for mental health students. But also, I like to always point out also an increase in concern for faculty and our students and, and our staff. So you can see when they were resurveyed in November, that number going up. So, um, what we do know from the survey is that the, the pandemic effects on our students uh, utilize mental health services on the community college. And they ha ha there has been an increase of 54% of students using mental health services in two year institutions. And also in the, this slide, you can see that like LCC, 47% of other colleges and, also implemented increased mental health support and resources for students. We strive to make this effort by creating the Mental Health and Wellness Center, which includes digital mental health programming partnership and created additional digital resources. We're gonna talk a little bit, touch that lightly in, a, in future slides. I'm gonna pause to see if there's any questions you have right now. Great, thank you. Um, Matt, I had seen your hand a little earlier. Did you have a question? I think Terry addressed it, but it was it was one of the earlier slides. I didn't know if the stats were pre-COVID because you were alluding to data over the last decade. And then I, I think you, you you circled back about the, the effects uh, uh, over the last year because of the pandemic. So I, I, I think you adequately, ad adequately addressed that. Thanks, Terry. And, and Terry, I had a question. Um, you mentioned that Oregon is 40% higher than other states in the United States. I know a couple of years back, we were identified as I believe the 49th state out of 50 in terms of the mental health services that we provide. Do you have a sense of where we're at now? We're not, the, we're, we're about the same in that number. Um, that's one, and I'll talk a little bit further about that, is that is one of the issues that our students face is the long waiting list to try to get in. There's just not enough mental health services for the students and individuals suffering with some severe mental health conditions. 
Yeah, it's, it's certainly unfortunate to see us all the way at 49. Matt? You're muted, sir. I, I saw Mike had his hand up, but if you want to come back to me, oh, I, yes. I have a follow-up. Great. Um, thank you for that, Mike. Hi, Terry. Um, Hi, Mike. I, I was under the impression that we do not have um, therapists on, on campus uh, staff. And I, so I, I'd like some clarity about that. Um, if someone needs um, therapy for four or five, 10 sessions, is that result in a referral usually, or do we have staff that, that actually do that? Um, that's an additional change, Mike. Um, we were able to hire one full-time clinician who's a licensed clinician, as well as we just hired a part-time uh, drug and alcohol clinician who's licensed. And going forth, all of our clinicians will be licensed to address these higher level needs. That's great news. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, quickly, Terry, could you go back to the slide, please, where I think there's 26 or 28 students that were just deemed uh, I think in your words were too violent. Um, oh, yes. So there were, they were they were Lane County residents in Eugene. Um, so so let me just I can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, and, and I have a question about about you know I know on campus we're in in county territory, and obviously if, if there was a you know. A, a, major incident, all neighboring agencies would, would, would arrive. But um, I'm wondering what our relationship is with White Bird Clinic and, and CAHOOTS, uh, if there's a mental health crisis, um, uh, especially for our, our students of color or our BIPOC population um, who may be in a crisis and, and not necessarily want to interact with, with law enforcement. Could you touch on that as well, please? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about it in future slides, but let me just say to you that since the Mental Health and Wellness Center uh, hired uh, clinicians, licensed clinicians, we, we uh, uh, created a uh, suicide prevention protocol. And currently, and I know the retention counselors on campus also uh, assist in this as well and have been for years. But what we do is right now we created a remote protocol. And when we receive an email or a report uh, of, of this, about the student or from the student, we immediately have a clinician uh, uh, reach out to that student and do uh, a wellness check, um, uh, uh, checking on what their status is. If we're very, very concerned about it and we think there's a high risk, it's been determined high risk, then we work with public safety to send uh, an, a, 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 to do a physical wellness check. And they, do, they coordinate it with if it's Eugene or Springfield or if the sheriff needs to go out. Um, and then we follow up with that student um, following that visit as well as ongoing and we create a treatment plan on how we're going to strategize to work with them and where they can come when they're feeling that way so that they're not out there alone feeling that way. So and I, and I, I can speak that we have a, a protocol designed for the future but I would also say on the very end of our presentation we're going to be doing something very exciting we're going to bring, because there's a lot of opinions on how to handle this, and we want to be very sensitive how we approach our students. And so we're created a, a stakeholders group that has about 15, 16 representatives from the campus of different departments, and that we're got, we uh, have hired a consultant to come in and discuss uh, best practices for suicide uh, prevention protocols. Um, and so we're excited about that because we'll all, the whole institution then will be on one page on how to handle these situations. Did that answer your question, Matt? Uh, well, partially, I'm still concerned or curious about the relationship with any partnering organizations in particular CAHOOTS. Well, we work with uh, White Bird as well and we've been strong partners of CAHOOTS. Um, there's some challenges when we're working with CAHOOTS on campus. Um, they have 
uh, limited hours. They start usually at 10 or 11. Um, they do not want to come on campus without a, a public safety escort. Um, and uh, if the student backs up and says they won't harm themselves or someone else, they leave campus. And so what we found 100% of the time when our office has worked with them is that then they turn around to us and say, no, I, I'm, I'm going to hurt myself or someone else. So at that point, we do call uh, the, the sheriff's office and they come in and work with the student and take them to the hospital to be further evaluated and possibly medicated if needed, or could they go home with a family member at that point? Thank you. But the, all those pro protocols are gonna be explored and examined so that we have the very best for the campus. Okay, I think if everybody got to ask their question for now, um, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Laura Green. Oh, I guess I have to get to the right slide. All right. Yeah, exactly. Oh, perfect. Okay, there yeah, you go. Perfect. Okay. So along with Terry, I'm very excited to introduce our plans for a new st student health and wellness center at LCC. So it is the goal of the Mental Health and Wellness Center and the health clinic to integrate services to create one umbrella department for holistic student wellness services. You can, yeah, thanks. Um, so in recognition, in recognition of mind-body interrelatedness, the core departments that will be housed in the Student Health and Wellness Center include the Mental Health and Wellness Center, the Health Clinic, Title IX, the Drug and Alcohol Program, and Wellness Education and Health Promotion. And Terry, do you wanna talk about, yeah. I swear I, I'm gonna get a t-shirt say, uh, saying I'm muted. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the current services of the Mental Health and Wellness Center. And I'll just remind you, we started in about August of this past year. And uh, we were able to uh, expand and the areas we are now working with is not only uh, our clinical mental health availability, but also we're partnering uh, with the community, uh, Lane County community in resources that are already out there working well and where, where can we share some of those resources. Um, we're looking at establishing clinical support groups and also educational programs, not only just for our students, but our staff and faculty. We've also incorporated Title IX, sexual assault and harassment, both the education and addressing any reports. And I note that we have the drug and alcohol program, and I'm going to talk a little further about that in future slides. But I would want to just put a plug in is that we're looking at looking at a holistic approach with all of what we're doing. And we're going to be moving the terminology to addiction, a center uh, that we're going to be looking at uh, addiction in our society. So many students need both mental health care and medical care. So the health clinic will complement and support the work in the mental health and wellness center. Being under one roof will allow us to serve mutual patients in a coordinated and streamlined way. Um, additionally, the health clinic will provide preventative health care and care for short-term illnesses, as Paul mentioned, public health response and coordination, very timely health promotion and education, and referrals to appropriate community medical resources. In addition to the departments I mentioned earlier, we are fortunate at LCC to have a wonderful array of other departments that can work together to provide a broad set of services to support student health, wellness, and ultimately student success. So these are some of the partners already existing on campus that will be working under the roof of the Student Health and Wellness Center. So Gender Equity, the Physical Therapy Assistant Program, 
fitness, lifestyle, and PE, massage therapy, nutrition, oral and dental care, and retention counseling. Community partners are also very excited and interested in working with the new Student Health and Wellness Center to bring our expertise to campus in such fields as sexual health, behavioral health, and social services. This will further ensure we offer the most holistic set of services to students we can right on campus. Um, if you are a more visual learner, here is an infographic of the Student Health and Wellness Center and the various components operating under the Student Health and Wellness Center umbrella. And we will once again pause here if folks have any questions thus far. Mike. Yes, um, so I was wondering about um, sort of common things that happen on campuses. For example, if uh, someone wants birth control prescription or uh, if they need an antibiotic for upper respiratory or urinary tract, uh, do, do we do that diagnosis and then uh, prescribe or do we refer those? Those type of um, short term kind of limited uh, things that arise, we do take care of that in the health clinic. If it's so going to be an ongoing thing, then we refer them uh, to a primary care provider or a specialist if it's more of a specialty type of service. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Laura, I was curious when you say under the same roof, do you mean all those integrated college services, those integrated college partners and the community partners are all going to be using the same physical space or do you mean that um, kind of metaphorically? Yes and no and yes. Um, okay. So the, the we'll sh talk a little bit more about physical space, but um, the Mental Health and Wellness Center and Health Clinic will be in one physical location. In that physical location, we hope to have space available for uh, community partners to come. And we're imagining this would be um, maybe Plant Parenthood comes one day a week and uses one of our exam rooms, or maybe Women's Space comes once every other week and uses one of our um, sweet new rooms to meet with people. Um, the massage therapy um, services that students will offer, again, that will be in that same physical location. Some of the other ones might be in different places on campus that are more appropriate. So if it's a fitness class, then that would be better to be in the fitness center. Um, the physical therapy assisting program, they want to run a musculoskeletal clinic and they wanna do it in their space because they have all their equipment that they need. So we hope to kind of have the kind of central hub be in one physical location and the things that make sense to occur in that space will, and the things that make sense to occur elsewhere will happen elsewhere, but it will all be coordinated and scheduled through the Student Health and Wellness Center. So for example, students will, that want any of these services will call one phone number or go to one website or one central email so that we are the ones figuring out what services will be a good fit for their needs as opposed to students having to look at this huge array of services and figure out like hmm, where, where it was best for them to plug in. Great, thank you for that detailed answer. I see Mike has his hand up as well. Yes, I was wondering about some of the um, the business as more business aspects. Do, do we have um, an electronic health record where we chart and keep track of patients? And then I was wondering about billing and insurance. Um, yes, we have we have we have an electronic health record in the clinic. The Mental Health and Wellness Center also has one. Eventually, we'll look to try to be under the same one. Um, there's some challenges with that, but over time, that is a goal of ours to merge um, and use one system. 
Um, and we have the capability of billing insurance, but we have run into some huge complications with that in the past. And um, we have done it and then we stopped because it really wasn't worth it. Um, and, you know, that could be a discussion again for the future once we kind of get this center up and running and see all the different services we have, if with more services and more people providing services, if it makes sense at that point to revisit, we are certainly open to looking at that question in the future. Thanks. Rosie? Thank you. What, what kind of liability does a community college take on when it provides this scope and breadth of services? And, and how are we um, handling that liability? I don't think that's a question for me to answer. That's not my area of expertise, but perhaps Michael Blade has something he'd like to add. Yeah, it's probably even a better question for Dawn Barth. I don't know if she's on here, but she's the insurance expert. But I mean, we have we we have insurance coverage for that type of thing, and um, any any people that come from outside of Lane to to do work at the at the clinic that are doctors or nurse practitioners, things like that, would have um, professional liability insurance of their own, malpractice insurance of their own. So I, I think we're you know, as covered as we can afford to be, you know, we would always probably like to have more insurance coverage, especially when the, when the, uh, you know, the lawsuit hits, but, um, you know, I think currently we're in a good spot with that. March. Yeah. When it comes to liability, the, the, I think the, the key word and, and our folks know, I talk about this a lot is scope, scope of practice. And I think by moving away from being a primary care, model, whether or not some folks use this as not or not, it, it almost doesn't matter. But if we move to, more towards episodic short term and we have more of this in and out of, of clients and um, of community services, we will reduce our liability. And for sure, as we move into this model, we will work side by side with our insurers because if, if they, we will follow their lead. It, it has always been one of my concerns to reduce the college's liability. So when you work with your insurer, they will tell you, as long as you stay within X and Y parameters, especially when it comes to medical malpractice, because anyone that's dealt with medical malpractice knows they will sue everybody right up to the board. And th their intent is the deep pockets, which is the college, which are not very deep, but other citizens may think so. So I think that the plan that these folks have laid out is definitely um, a, what I would call a holistic model is, a, is, is will reduce, I think, our liability. It will spread, it will spread care across mental, physical, episodic care in a way that I think will be much better. But to be sure, we're not experts. We will consult with the experts and we'll make sure we, we maintain a level of care that is insurable that we could afford. Thank you, Marge. Um, I see Angela has her hand up. Thank you. Um, I had some questions regarding liability as well, less on the sort of medical malpractice perspective and more from a sort of um, EHR technology, HIPAA compliance type of perspective. Um, Medical is a very, very complex business, which is not, I think, the primary business of education. Um, and it is, there are a number of different pitfalls, uh, not just medical malpractice, but um, for instance, the proposal to roll up substance use disorder treatment with other types of treatment makes me very uncomfortable because of the restrictions around patient information, specifically with respect to um, 42 CFR part two, where you can't even within a single organization share information about a member's or a patient's substance use disorder treatment. Um, and so sharing EHRs amongst different areas of practice is just fraught. Um, so, 
And so my day job is obviously in health insurance. And so, and my focus is Medicaid. And so I, I love the idea of the integrated care model. It's clearly the direction that OHA is going, um, the direction that healthcare is going. I think that's, that's the future. What I'm concerned about is administering it at the community college level. Um, it makes me very, very nervous. What sorts of, um, I guess, Marge, you mentioned speaking to professionals. What sorts of plans do we have in place for a legal review from somebody who is a HIPAA expert, um, you know, risk management assessment, mitigation strategies, super robust um, EHR, PMP, and auditing processes, like, I know that that's operational and I don't necessarily need to know those details, but I want to know that that is very thought out and it makes me very nervous. Um, Paul? And yeah, then... I was going to say, we, we can let Mike talk about that, but without a doubt, we will have to have other experts consult. And I see Terry shaking her head with regard to mental health. I, I think, and if I could comment, I mean, I think that all good questions, I mean, not the the, the scope of what we thought we were presenting today. And I think we're, we're totally happy to engage in that conversation uh, uh, in, on a level when we're more prepared uh, to address that issue. So I appreciate those questions. I will say though that, um, you know, we've had a, a health clinic on campus for decades, I think, um, uh, functioning. I know it's not commonplace in um, uh, Oregon at community colleges. Coming from the California community college system, it's incredibly common to have health clinics on community college campuses. Every uh, college I've worked at, uh, I've had as part of my responsibility or, or, or on a campus, uh, a student health clinic. So I think it is more centered around scope of what is being offered and making sure that we have the proper liability and insurance coverage to, to, to feel comfortable about offering those services. Because from a student access point of view, I do know that these are things that make every bit of a difference for our students and our student population in particular uh, with the ability to progress toward their goal attainment. So um, I, I think it's a worthwhile adventure to make sure people feel comfortable about us having the right kind of liability coverage for the scope that we're offering. And I certainly want to have that conversation, but uh, I think we'll probably have to, to come back with a more detailed report or discussion about that at a later date. Great. Thank you, Paul. Um, so. Um, I, I appreciate you um, acknowledging that you were more prepared to give a broader oversight and look forward to um, hearing more about that in the future. Um, who, who is going to continue to present? Is um, Terry or Laura? Terry, <clears throat> Terry, excuse me. And I, I would say in, in a summary is that we're looking at those. We're not the first school to do this. There are many schools across the nation that are looking at responding to these needs that interfere with student success and retention. Um, pulling counseling and the health clinic and some of these resources together. I would also say that's one of the reasons we're also moving to license clinical staff um, and, and so that there can be some supervision with uh, licensed clinicians. Even as we talk about space and software, we're always looking at HIPAA and we're lo looking at how can we share some space? Where do we have commonality? And then uh, we just uh, submitted a request to have uh, uh, to see, put the uh, mental health and wellness center with next to the health clinic where it would be in lower building 18. And we, we, and I appreciate what you said about the drug and alcohol and addiction program that would have a separate room of itself. It's just that students wouldn't have to run around campus. They could get right to the, uh, the, the center and, and have those resources nearby. Um, uh, so we're really excited about, because sharing some space, most of our students have very layered and complicated issues. We're currently right now working so closely with the medical team right now as we're dealing with some severe mental health issues. Um, to, and that's been so helpful uh, during that. And uh, drug and alcohol and other issues will be woven into those areas as well. 
Um, so we're excited about looking at space um, and, and, and even looking, schools are moving to have a quiet room. Um, we, we need a place where students can calm down and not have to have public safety stand there with the student, but that a clinician and staff can be there. All right. Um, Laura, you're up. Yep. Um, so in addition to the shared location, we're also, also planning to combine administrative support where it makes sense um, to increase efficiency, decrease cost, and most importantly, as I already talked about, provide one clear way for students to access all of the services of the Student Health and Wellness Center. I don't need to read through all of that. You can read it. Um, so in order to provide the most comprehensive set of services to students, uh, we are excited to partner with many academic programs on campus. This also provides opportunities for students in their programs to practice skills and gain experience right here on campus. Um, so just one example that I already kind of mentioned is that the physical therapy assisting program, uh, the faculty are interested in setting up a musculoskeletal clinic where students and faculty would work together to see other students with musculoskeletal complaints, provide some initial assessment and maybe a set of um, exercises to send home with people. Again, massage therapy, uh, their program is interested in having services for their students, providing massage therapy services from the clinic. Fitness students are interested in providing fitness opportunities or creating videos that can be on the Student Health and Wellness Center website. Um, and medical assisting students and nursing students can have opportunities in the health clinic. Um, I know we just kind of had questions, but we're kind of moving on to a different section. So I don't know if there's any questions that are popping up right now. I'm not seeing any hands, but why don't we go ahead and finish the presentation and then we'll, we'll finish up with questions. So we did want to touch a little bit of the initiatives that we have already um, successfully started. Um, there's a lot we're working on, but I think it's exciting to talk about what we have been able to com complete so far. And we've been collecting information from campus partners We've been able to hire uh, uh, one new uh, licensed mental health clinician and a, one part-time drug and alcohol clinician. We've done all those bone uh, skeleton uh, uh, areas. We're starting up a whole system of a web page, email addresses, phones. That was a real education for me. Um, and, it, and all the backbones, uh, getting that up and running for students as soon as possible. We're also working very closely with a software company that we uh, are working with that uh, is HIPAA compliant. And we're working very hard to keep that information separate from any other sources on campus. Uh, we also adopted the campus crisis number, the 8888 number where any faculty or staff when we're on campus and they have a situation arise and they're not sure how to handle it, they can call us and receive immediate help and assistance. Um, one, I am so proud of this and so excited. We were able to secure a software called Talk Campus. And this is especially vital while we're remote, but this is something I think will be fantastic even after we're remote uh, and when we return to campus. This is a, a, an app for students that we pay for so that the students can have uh, the app wherever they go 24 seven and they're able to go in there and there's a dashboard on tips of, on, and, and how to handle and uh, different situations and resources. But it also, we've asked and worked with the company to increase the resources to this, as, as, uh, to certain student areas that we saw kind of a, a, a lag in. And that was our veterans, our LGBTQ population. And we're currently working with them now on working to add services for our recently incarcerated students. Um, 
what's also exciting is that about a month after every term, this company uh, works across uh, its 50 countries are involved in this and it's monitored by professionals. Uh, and I am alerted if any uh, cases escalate. Um, but the, the survey that was completed, um, students, they asked students what they found helpful. And one of the things we found out is a lot of our students signed up to be peers on, on the, with Talk Campus and went through training to do that. And in addition, many of the students' responses were very similar to this, is that this was something that kept them connected to the to, to the world. It helped them normalize some of the feelings they were having and that, uh, that it, you know, and we're, we're finding this is working for our students that are right now in Africa, Russia, and China. So some other initiatives that we, we want to really expand on is our addiction program. And I, we mentioned the drug and alcohol counselor I, but also are partnering with the community. There's vast support groups out there that we would like to do something virtually right now, but also share some space on campus for our current students. Um, and we have also joined the Substance uh, Misuse Coalition with other community colleges in Oregon. And in addition, we're looking at what kind of remote support can we provide to our students? trying to think out of the box and in a holistic viewpoint. So um, we're excited about this as well, is that um, you'll see here various support groups that we offered. And we offered these in response to some current events and issues that students were dealing with. A death of a faculty member, inauguration, January 6th, uh, election day. So we had great response and our clinicians were able to offer that remotely. And again, it doesn't stop just on campus where we immediately reached out to community partners such as Center for Family Development, who now we have an agreement between us that they will make LCC students a priority on their referral list. Um, and their hope is when we're back on campus that they will be able to hire a counselor and, and have them here on campus with us. Um, Lane County Behavior Health, we're in conversations with them right now to talk about that. Title IX, sexual harassment and assault, we're partnering a lot, uh, uh, with our gender equity. All, uh, we've increased our training for students and staff. And a grant. We just started in August, but we just are submitting two grants for mental health awareness training and suicide prevention. And we'll hear the decision on that probably sometime in June. Cross your fingers. And I, I can't uh, be remiss without saluting and thanking the LCC Foundation. They were able to get on the phone when we called them and they called uh, uh, donors and they were able to totally 100% support Talk Campus uh, and staff professional development. And it got ongoing, all kinds of support groups for students, especially while we're remote. And uh, also presentations. We've been engaged with student government, with faculty classes, um, also uh, new student orientations and for international students. And I'm just gonna pass this because I know we wanna be mindful of time. This is an important part is we're starting two stakeholder work groups. One to focus on how can our campus best serve our students with mental health needs. There is a lot going on on this campus and we would like to streamline it and make sure we're not duplicating services and that we're doing it in a way that students and staff know where to send students or to come. And the second work group is on suicide prevention protocols. Um, and we're hoping that through those uh, two work groups that by spring term, we'll have some ideas of some clarity on these areas. And we're excited uh, to have Roger uh, Brubaker, who works for the Prevention Lane 
who will be coming on and being the facilitator for the suicide prevention protocols. And right now, when we made this PowerPoint a week ago, there were 14 different areas of campus that represented uh, were represented on the stakeholders. And this is growing as we go, because we want to be inclusive and get every voice we can, but still have the group a size that we can move forward. Oh, here okay. we are. Question. Great. Thank you so much, um, Terry and Laura. Um, I have Mike Eister first in the queue. So I, I just want to commend the, the group on this integrated uh, approach. It seems like a, a good idea to me. I also think it was perfectly appropriate to reduce the scope and uh, move away from primary care to make sure that students who need long-term care are being seen by the uh, appropriate professionals that really is beyond the scope of a community college. So I, it all seems to me like a, a move in the right direction. Matt Keating. Thanks. Um, question about the reach uh, of, of the users of the app. How many either raw numbers or percentage of our student body are utilizing that service? And then a follow up to that would be it's great that 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 application is, is there. I appreciate utilizing technology. Um, but in the midst of a pandemic, our neighbors to the north and our neighbors to the south, California and Washington, uh, are um, are using uh, applications to alert the community on an, on an opt in basis uh, about exposure to the coronavirus. So I'm wondering from a physical health standpoint, um, I'm wondering from a physical health standpoint, uh, if, if, if you would in, endorse the use of such an application in Oregon, or if, if, uh, if you see that there'd be an advantage of using uh, like an express app, uh, opt-in app um, here in Lane County. But the first question is, 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 is simply, what's, what's the user base uh, look like? How, how many? Uh, this is our second term in utilizing it, and we had over 180 students utilize it this term. Um, and this, it, it, we notice each term it's growing, um, actually through students talking about it with students. We sent out an invite twice during the term, but in the beginning of the term, and then usually midterm, we send another invite to the student. We also connect them because a lot of students are referred to us by faculty or other staff. We also invite them to have that in addition to their virtual one-to-one -one with a clinician. And to your second question, absolutely, yes, it's a, a part of our grant proposal was to look at some additional uh, uh, software and apps, uh, uh, as you're mentioning. We're looking under every stone to see how can we creatively and make sure it's accessible to our students, both when we come on campus and remotely. How can we be there for them? Did that answer your question, Matt? So you would endorse a, a, an application that would be an opt-in app uh, to track physical uh, exposure to, to, to the virus as well. well uh, Laura, I don't know if you have an opinion on the virus um, or. Well, Matt, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Oregon is in the process already, that that's on its way. Um, the, the same program that California and Washington are using, it's just not up and running yet, but I think all of the infrastructure is already in place. They haven't, they just haven't kind of pressed go on it yet. Great, uh, thank you. And, and if I could just follow up quickly, um, back to the, to the first question, are there things that, that the college can do or the board can encourage uh, to uh, promote usage of the application in a, in a, wider, uh, uh, a wider array? Maybe in, in a welcoming email, there's a link. Um, are, are there any, are there any, have there been any conversations about that? And uh, finally, and other colleagues may, I don't want to monopolize the space, but I'm also concerned about representation. Uh, I appreciate the LGBTQIA community being addressed, but are, are there BIPOC representatives uh, 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 able to interface with students of color uh, in a time of crisis as well? If you're referring to the talk campus, absolutely. It's across 50 countries. 
Um, I think there's 25 languages uh, and uh, that's a very diverse po uh, student population that it reaches. Um, I would say we struggle with communicating sometimes to our students. They get lots of emails. So we're a little cautious how many we send out, but we are working with student government and all of our newspapers or you know, electronic communications to students to get it out to them as well. Um, we were interviewed by uh, uh, the school paper. Um, and uh, you know, uh, we're open any idea to get it out there, uh, uh, you know, to communicate this. And I think it's gonna grow. Um, we have it on our website, because if you'll notice on our webpage, we have a lot of resources of you know, even about uh, um, uh, yoga, a couple minute video on yoga and different things to help students, but we have the talk campus links and other links, not only the, the ones we provide, but also that uh, are in our community. Elsie. Thank you. Um, first off, I just wanna say thank you so much for this presentation and for, um, the level of care and seriousness that this team seems to be taking um, mental health care and mental wellness among students um, as an individual with, um, you know, many diagnosed long-term mental health issues, including major depressive disorder and anxiety disorder. Um, I just want to say thank you. Um, I um, This was a really important presentation, especially as someone who has had their academic career impacted by um, the state of their mental health. So thank you. Um, I have worked in healthcare um, before, and so my mind immediately goes to some of the questions that um, Angela posed. Um, I, of course, want to be um, respectful of the board's role in terms of how deeply we get into the weeds of operations um, and ongoing day-to-day -day work such as that. Um, but I do have similar questions um, that Angela posed, um, but mostly want to offer to um, you know, the presenters today and the team that if there's anything you can think of in terms of the board and the what support that you need from us or what questions you might have for us on how to make this the most successful possible. Um, I just wanted to put that out there that, you know, of course we ask a lot of questions of you, but I also want to make sure that you know that um, you know, tap into the resources that are available here on this board if you need any support um, or, you know, what you need to be successful moving forward. Thank you, Chelsea. Th thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm going to put myself in the queue here quickly, and then I'll let Marge wrap it up. And um, we are a little more than over time on what we put on the agenda for this, but it's, it's been a really thorough presentation, and I want to thank everybody. Um, I, I, I'm very impressed at the way that we are thinking about this as a college and the, the work that has gone into this. I love how our programs like the PT program are being integrated, how we are integrating community partners and our own college services in a very comprehensive, holistic fashion. I heard decreased cost and liability mentioned and we know that's been a goal for a long time. Um, I am um, hoping we will hear about the progress that's being made. Two things I would like to have followed up on are the protocols that are going to be explored. I do have concerns about when we contact the sheriff or even our own um, you know, security, safety staff when somebody is in crisis. And so I'd, I'd love to hear more about those protocols being explored. And um, you also mentioned a, um, a stakeholder representative group that you're working with. And I, I'd love to hear more about that and know that we're thinking about um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color being adequately represented and using an equity lens for this work as well. But thank you very much. Marge, did you want to wrap us up? Yeah, I do. Thank you so much. You, you actually gave a great summary. Um, I can't thank these folks enough because from the day I landed, um, I just felt we could do better, different, meet, meet needs more without with reducing liability. 
but this far exceeded my expectations. This is just from, from a healthcare provider's perspective, integrated health is the way to go. Um, so we will come back in a couple of months. I wanna give these, time, these folks time to continue to put it together. We'll continue to do more research. And I honestly think this could be a national model. Um, I, I, I'm so impressed with the level of professionalism that they've attacked this with. So um, glad you all enjoyed the presentation and we'll be back for follow-up. Great, thank you very much. All right, so I'm gonna move us on to our board one um, our board zone one position position update. And um, I am going to start it off with a little update from the US Department of Education, which announced today more Biden Harris appointees. And you will recognize one Melanie Munzer um, was appointed to chief of staff office of the undersecretary and will be serving um, in Washington DC with the Biden administration. It is official and um, she said it was fine to share it with people tonight. So really excited for her though, um, miss her already. And in terms of our board um, zone one position update, the position is posted um, we have scheduled interviews for February 27th um, at 2 p.m. So please note that time. We did shift the time to the afternoon. Um, there was one conflict in the morning. So we'll, we'll be gathering at 2 and likely the first interview will be shortly after that so that we can get gathered and settled and organized. Um, those interviews will be virtual. Um, though they, it, it will be um, moderated in a way that respects the individuals that are participating. And um, I am working on the questions and we'll get those um, to board members prior to our interviews. Um, we have not received any applications as of yet, um, but I have talked to some interested community members and the word is getting out there. So. Um, that's exciting. And um, the only other thing that I wanted to bring up this evening related to board zone one position is that um, Melanie Munzer was serving as the vice chair. And I, I'm going to follow our past kind of um, practice for this situation. In the past, what we have done is board members have expressed interest at a meeting. And then at the following meeting, we have um, then elected these positions. So the person who um, is elected to serve in the vice chair role would be um, filling the remainder of Melanie's year. So it would be for the remainder of this school year and take us up until the end of June. And so I wanted to, I emailed this out to board members and um, letting people know that we would be hearing from people who were interested tonight and we'll make a decision at our board meeting because as is customary, we don't make decisions um, in our work session. So I'm wondering if there are any board members who would like to express interest in the vice chair role tonight? Um, Mike Eister. I would say that I'm happy to serve. I don't want to uh, get in the way of anyone else who would like to do it. Uh, it's just, it's a, a fairly short time period and uh, I, I would be happy to, to fill in that spot. Great, thank you, Mike. Um, and I see Chelsea Jennings hand, Chelsea. Thank you. Um, I would also like to express my interest in um, filling the remainder of the vice chair term um, for the remainder of um, the next couple months. Thank you, Chelsea. Is there anyone else who would like to express interest? Um, Rosie Pryor? Yeah, I have the same uh, response as Mike. I'm willing to serve. I don't want to stand in anybody else's way. I do think we have a complicated year ahead of us 
uh, starting now and going beyond the election of new members to the college board. And I do think, see some uh, continuity as being a good thing. Thank you. Okay. So um, last call, Matt Keating. You could just name us all vice chair because <laughs> uh, like, like my colleagues mentioned before me, uh, if there was a need, I was going to throw my hat in the ring, but seeing such a, 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 a great array of, of, of interest, uh, I, I won't um, because I think I hold the record for the longest serving vice chair in the history of the college. So if, if need be great, but uh, if you'd like to, 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 to don us all vice chair, great. And if one of the aforementioned uh, ends up serving, great, the college is, is in a good place. Thanks for that, Matt. All right, so I don't have anything else in, in that regard. Um, we'll address that at our um, next board meeting. So let's move on to the applied baccalaureate, baccalaureate, <laughs> baccalaureate, baccalaureate, baccalaureate. You got to get the little rhythm going there. Um, and Provost Jarrell is going to talk about that with us um, along with, I believe, Grant Matthews and Patrick Blaine. Yeah, I've brought uh, Grant Matthews, who's our Associate Vice President for Career Technical Education Workforce Development, and Patrick Blaine, who's uh, Dean over Curriculum Assessment and Grants Development. Um, basically, what we wanted, we've present, provided you with uh, some materials, and in the interest of time to, to try to get, get us back on track, we'll forego any kind of formal presentation uh, and entertain some questions, but I'll just provide a little bit of context and, and tell you that Grant, Grant and Patrick have been engaged on the ground level in terms of what the process is like, so if there are questions about process, I'll rely on them to kind of fill in uh, some of the details if you had questions, but as an overview, you know, basically many states in the in the country, uh, I think the uh, close to 30 states now uh, allow, uh, have passed legislation to allow community colleges to offer four-year degrees. And these are typically in areas where there is a workforce demand that can't be met uh, uh, for the baccalaureate degree, trying to reach some kind of a goal or degree attainment uh, for, for the particular states. And also to, to recognize that um, community colleges that offer four-year degrees really provide access to that degree uh, to populations of students that historically uh, would not have access through traditional university or four-year colleges. I think that um, Oregon is well situated to address in, uh, all of those issues, and this would be good for Oregon. And recently, um, uh, a couple years ago, there was legislation passed that, that did permit uh, community colleges to in Oregon to offer applied baccalaureate degrees. We just got all of the details uh, worked out and delivered from the heck uh, recently. And the first step in that is getting um, support from uh, our local board of education to pursue the possibility of offering a, a four-year degree. So in terms of process, in a nutshell, what it would mean is that we would start with uh, uh, requesting if you feel appropriate at the business meeting, board business meeting, uh, a vote of support to pursue this degree. We do feel it's in the best interest of the college, the students and the community uh, to pursue that. Once we get that, uh, I would work with um, uh, Grant and Patrick and others on campus, uh, numerous fact, we've already had some initial conversations about what would be particular uh, degrees that would be beneficial to the community and the college. We would work on developing those degrees. There's a multi-step process to get approval from the state. And you all would also have to approve, the board would have to approve those specific degrees. So that's pretty much the process in a nutshell. We would be looking on the outset of not being able to offer these for a couple of years if everything even went perfectly because of the timeline uh, of it. But it would be you know, something that, that we feel there's interest in, in campus and need in the community and would be good for our students to support. So with that, uh, I, I'll just uh, entertain some questions. We, we have, like I said, I've got Grant and Patrick here uh, that can certainly uh, field some more detailed questions if you have them. I'm muted. Are there any questions from board members? Um, Matt Keating. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, 
this is exciting to see come to fruition. I've been advocating for this uh, since I first learned about it at a national level uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, recognizing the success in the state of Florida. So mm. it's good to see uh, see this uh, uh, rolled out. Uh, in Florida in particular, uh, the, the colleges have dropped the, the community from the name for the purpose of recognizing the four-year degree because not not because there's a stigma attached to what was once known as a junior college the community college but because community colleges are often associated with a two-year program is there any talk among the Oregon 17 community colleges who are embracing this uh it, it would we become Lane College uh, as to, to how we would recognize uh one of our students going through a, a a baccalaureate program on campus? You know, it's a good question. There are a couple routes. I mean, you could re retain being a community college, but you could be a community college and a college or something like that. I, I haven't heard any specific conversations about that. I see Marge has her hand up. I don't know if Marge or or uh, Grant or Patrick have heard anything specific about that. I'm not sure yet, but that is a common theme in, in the states that have gone that route. Yeah, ditto to what Paul said. I've seen other states <clears throat> do that, but they do it... Um, as they're doing some other coordinated emphasis. So whether it would be maybe in health careers, uh, maybe it's a huge donor. There's a lot of different reasons why colleges change their name. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of interesting talk about the name Lane. Um, so I think down the road though, this will set this college up. Ultimately it's up to the board. It, there, I think heck, not heck so much as the um, OCCA hasn't even begun to talk about this. So that's a great, forward-thinking question, and something Brett, to kind of keep there. Brett did just mention that, uh, texted me that, that I guess led their specific legislation in Oregon that requires the colleges to have community colleges in their yeah. name. So, uh, is that right? So oh, that yeah. would have to be addressed <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I was gonna say, it, you know, there's nothing about uh, an applied baccalaureate that requires that you <clears> drop <throat> the community component of the name. And in fact, Oregon's designing of the applied baccalaureate very specific to the community colleges is in an emphasis to keep the community aspect of the community college. Great, thank you. Um, I have Rosie Pryor in the queue. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not really clear in my own mind how I feel about this, but what I do want to telegraph is that I'm a big believer that information is power. So I'm really, really glad that you're looking at it. And I welcome the analysis. And I look forward to the results of your analysis and your recommendations. Great. Thank you. Let, let me leave you with one example, if you don't mind. And I'll use dental or nursing. There are states where the minimum standard is the four-year degree. And in those states, if you were poised as a two-year college to give a four-year degree, you were poised to move to the next level and offer that degree. Now, it hasn't happened out here, but it could. You, you just never know when the, the required level for a licensed practitioner, it could be PTA someday. I mean, we don't know. So we, we would be set up at least with this model. Thanks for that, Marge. Um, Mike? I just want to say I think it's a good direction, and uh, that's it. Yeah, I, I love the, I mean, if you look at the states where um, this model has taken off, I mean, Washington, uh, as, as um, uh, Matt mentioned, Florida, if you look at the, the completers of, of baccalaureates, I mean, they tend to be more place bound. So they, they do, as to Grant's point, rep, represent and, and really retain that community aspect, which I think is important. They by and large more are people of color. So there's this, this access that you don't see. And if you look at the average age, it's substantially different. The average age of applied baccalaureate uh, degree attainment in Washington state, I think is 32 years old or something like that. So, so you really are serving a population that doesn't have access to the to the education that's there now, and they are for designed specifically for workforce entry and advancement, right? So it really does fit that that local uh, community need. So we're excited to pursue it. Rosie, so I do have one question, and um, if you don't have the answer tonight, that's fine. I'd be interested to know: Are the four-year colleges and universities in Oregon? Is there a pushback about this direction? 
I think it, so I can give you a more complete answer at a later date or maybe in private, but uh, the, 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 the short answer is we haven't seen a significant um, pushback yet. I think where we'll start to see pushback is when we start to see the specific degrees that are being presented to HEC for approval, right? And if it's perceived as direct competition, for example, with the U of O or, or, or maybe uh, Southern Oregon, then I think we might see some lobbying against it. I know in California, when this tried to go through, there was significant lobbying from uh, the Cal State system against it. So, so I think that's there. But I think we're, you know, Oregon's being really mindful about it being that true applied sense and really trying to provide access that, that's not being provided otherwise. And if you look at the, uh, the presentation, if you have a chance, the approval process has a 90 day wait period between mm -hmm. the time where you propose a program and when you move it through the state. And that 90 day period is really designed so that partners within the community, partners within the university, partners within the private industry can be involved in providing feedback and or partnering in the final product of the applied right. baccalaureate. Great, and um, I did have myself in the queue because I just wanted to be clear on the process that we're discussing. So at the, the next board meeting, you would want the Board of Education to affirm that the college will be moving forward with pursuing this, but then there's an entire process for state approval and new queue approval and accreditation. So. We're talking about a very long-term process. Yeah, this is basically, uh, you know, this is basically the board saying that we're, you know, we're we're interested in this idea and we're willing to pursue the conversation further, uh, not wasting our time to go through this multi-step process of of trying to get to that point if if the board doesn't have support uh, for the college pursuing any four-year degree uh, specific degrees. You'll have to approve ultimately, um, and it is a, it will be a multi-step process. Great. Well, I. I appreciate that clarification and I, I am excited about this as well as <clears throat> other people have mentioned. I, you know, I think it's building on some of the strengths. It sounds to me like we can build on some of the strengths that we have. Um, and from the articles that I've read, um, it, it does also sound that like these programs serve um, racially and economically diverse communities and communities that are often marginalized. And, and that's very exciting to me. I would um, definitely want to hear more information in the future about how we're engaging with faculty in this decision-making and um, you know, how we're approaching that accreditation process and that approval process, process collaboratively with faculty. Certainly, that'll be the next step once we have uh, your approval or vote of support to move forward. I will tell you, we've already engaged with several departments on campus just to, to test uh, what kind of interest there would be among faculty for it. Uh, some of the, we've listed the programs that we've listed in there that are potential for consideration. We have engaged with faculty in those areas and, and started conversations about what would be needed to be able to be successful in that endeavor. And, and, and for the most part, people are pretty excited about it across, across the campus. Great, thank you, Paul. Matt, did you put your hand down or did you have something you wanted to say? I think you're muted. You're, you're, you don't look like you're muted, but we can't hear you. You were frozen first. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Now, it, my, my inquiry w was along the same lines as yours in regards to needing direction. And it, it sounds like at our next board meeting, we'll be taking on a motion to direct the college to pursue the applied baccalaureate. It doesn't sound like it's needed tonight. That's correct. correct. It would work. It would work at the business meeting. We could, we could work within that timeline. Okay, great. And I think we, we talked about making sure it was on the agenda, Paul. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And if in the interim, if there's anything you need to help with your decision making or further clarifications, uh, uh, Grant, Patrick, and I are here at your disposal to provide you whatever information you might need. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so the last item on our agenda tonight is our board policies. And um, I am going to turn it over to Michael Blade, our legal hey, thank counsel. You. Yes, uh, so the members of the board, you might notice that we're doing something a little different um, than we've been doing, which is kind of going through the OCCA board policies and comparing them to lane policies. In this iteration, we're doing it the opposite way, going through lane policies and comparing them to OCCA policies. 
The reason for that is these policy, these lane policies um, needed to be reviewed. They hadn't been, they'd either never been reviewed or they hadn't been reviewed since 2016 or, or before. And so in order, for, you know, the accreditors are coming and we want to make sure that we're reviewing policies on a, on a time, in a timely basis, uh, in a timely manner. And so um, that's, that's why we're taking one sort of month to do this and knock these out there. Luckily there were only seven of them. If there'd been 20 of them, we might have to do it multiple months, but there were only seven. So um, we're going to try to knock as many of these out as we can this month, uh, hopefully all of them, but if not, at least the bulk of them and try to get, uh, you know, us in a good place for the accreditors when they come visit. <clears throat> so with that being said, um, so can, can, oh, can we go ahead and walk through them one at a time? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I just wanted to give that just to, to if anybody was wondering why we were doing something different. Um, so the first one is, is uh, lane policy 605, which is advertising. Um, if we, Brett, could you share the screen with the colored chart? Might be the way to go or somebody. I still don't know how to do it. Every time I try to do it, it, it doesn't you want to You want to learn how? I probably should learn how, yes. Do you have the document? I have it. Well, I can pull it up here. Try clicking the save, the, the green shared screen at the bottom. Oh. Well, it's... It's there now. Okay, great. I'll tell you what, I, I promise I'll learn that by, by the time for the, for the board meeting. Okay. So the first one is, is advertising. There is no board policy. If you've read the, the advertising lane policy, it makes sense. I don't think there's, uh, you know, OCCA was going to touch on anything like this. Um, there's no corresponding OCCA board policy. Uh, I think this is fairly um, straightforward and, I, I didn't really see anything that gave me pause in the board policy for advertising. So if we are, if you all decide you want to keep it, um, I think that's fine. We just renumber it when the time comes to, to match up with the OCCA, find a, find the slot in the OCCA numbering where this would go. Uh, so this one um, there's, there's nothing really to compare. It's just, you know, do you want to keep it, tweak it or get rid of it? Hey, anybody have any questions or thoughts on LCC board policy 605 on advertising? Okay, I'm not seeing any, so let's move on to the next one. Okay, the next one's conflicts of interest and that is uh, related to uh, the board members conflicts of interest. Uh, I don't think this will come as any shock to any of you um, that, that uh, conflicts of interest are frowned upon among board members. Uh, the OCCA policy is, a, is slightly less uh, detailed perhaps, but it, the, the language contains the, you know, the same uh, reference to state laws and government ethics that the lane policy contains. And, and this one is legally advised and accreditation related. I think this is something we're gonna have to have in, in one form or another. And so, uh, you know, unless there's something in the lane policy that that the board wants to retain that isn't in the OCCA policy, my recommendation would be to just um, accept the OCCA policy and revoke the, the lane policy. Hey, Mike Eister. I, I lean in the direction of um, going with the state policy uh, and, and I particularly like the uh, going in the direction of OCCA um, unless there's a very specific reason to stick with an LCC policy in, in this particular case, I, I favor um, going with the uh, OCCA policy. Is there anyone else who has any um, thoughts or questions? Um, one, one thing I am curious about, um, Mike, is Michael Blade, um, is when we are referencing ORSs in our policies, is it possible that we can hyperlink them so that when you're looking at a board policy, we would be able to click on the hyperlink and just look, go directly to the ORS? It, are you talking about the documents that I prepare? No, not, no, not the documents the you prepare. I mean, actually in our policy. Oh, line. yes, absolutely. Yes, those are all the hyperlinked. Okay, great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. And I could do it in these if that would be in my sort of uh, where I cut and paste them. If that would be helpful, I'd be happy to do that. But 
this it, is the first time anybody's. It, it would, it's um, always great. I mean, okay. I, I did actually go in and search for that one myself. So, which is not a big deal, but it's always nice to have the hyperlink there. Thank you for offering that. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, if I... Anyone else on BP 610? All right. So let's move on to LCC board policy 615 consensual relationships. Yeah, so this is a this is a policy that Lane has, and OCCA doesn't have any corresponding policies um, to this, which I was a bit surprised by. Um, but I think that um, this is a policy that we need to be we need to be looking at pretty carefully. Um, you know, the the allowing consensual relationships among whether it's employee employee consensual relationships or employee student consensual relationships is, is, you know, it can be problematic. It can cause liability for the college. Um, I, I think it, it's very difficult in a workplace, especially one as large as Lane uh, is to prohibit employee employee consensual relationships. I do think we need to make sure that we're prohibiting them. If there is a uh, supervisory or a value evaluative um, position that one party holds over the other, uh, you know, but if you've got a, you know, somebody that's in, um, that's a faculty member in one area and somebody that's a faculty member in a completely different area, it's going to be, it's, it's pretty tough to, to limit those um, uh, relationships. The student employee relationship is one that I think this, our current, I would encourage the board to really think about prohibiting those. Um, because it's inherently unequal in power. And I think allowing employees to uh, have a relationship with students, whether it's consensual or not, whether that student is in, in there, obviously if they're, in, if they're in that faculty member's class or even in that faculty member's major, I would, or area of, area of uh, teaching, I would say that should be prohibited. I would feel more comfortable if it was prohibited altogether, because again, the, the power structure is such that it's inherently uh, unequal. And I think it puts the, it, it not only puts the college in, in a, a position of potential liability, but it puts the employee in a tight spot. If they have a consensual relationship with a student and it goes sideways, uh, you know, that, that person is, if, if they do anything, even, even remotely close to something that's, that's not, uh, that's not that's unwanted by the student can really put them in a position to be terminated. Um, and I, I'd hate to see that. So anyway, that, that's just from the lawyer's perspective, that's what I'd like to see. Uh, but obviously it's up to you all. Okay, so in the queue, I have Mike Eister first followed by Chelsea Jennings. So Mike, I can't remember what your magnifying glass signifies. Uh, that means that there that we're we're uh, looking at this through an equity lens as well. Thank you. Um, the uh, it, it's hard for me to I know this is a highly complex area, and uh, and an evolving area has been evolving for a number of years, but it's hard for me to imagine that uh, OCCA doesn't have a policy, and it seems to me that we we would want to suggest to them that they develop a, a model policy, and they may want to model it after ours, I'm not sure. That's, that's all I had. Okay, Chelsea. Thank you. Um, so in relation to, so I'm looking at the potential issues for equity lens analysis for, it looks like three of the board policies we're talking about tonight. Um, so first off, the issues, so it says the issues below have been identified by staff in relation to the policies being presented at this meeting. So my question, my first question is, is it an issue with the way that the policy is currently written or what, what issue are we exactly looking at here in terms of, I mean, I'm gonna use this as the, the first board policy because we're talking about it now, but um, what, I'm trying to, I guess I'm trying to wrap my head around what's being communicated here with these bullet points for the equity, equity lens analysis and how we can um, 
address these concerns. Marge, did you want to address that or did you, did we want Deborah to do that? I'll give it short and then I'll pass it over to Deborah. Mm -hmm. uh, first and foremost, since the day I've arrived, I have dealt with these. They are, they never end well here at Lane. Okay. So you need to know I've dealt with many of these. They don't end well. The equity lens to me is who isn't in this room and there's no students here. We have power over students and we have power over subordinates. It, it's inferred, it's implied. So to me, this is this equity lens is who isn't in the room from my perspective. Deborah? Um, yeah, I think if I could just address um, what I'm hearing, Chelsea, as your question sort of generally, what is the, what's the purpose or how was this, this sheet designed or this supplement designed? And the thought behind it was that um, in conversations with the board in retreats or in other um, discussions that we've had, um, specifically about the equity lens, but about equity related issues, there's always been, there have been several kind of questions, what can we do to better integrate that work for you so that you can um, use the equity lens in a consistent fashion um, as you, you've chosen to do as a board. And so this was just an attempt to kind of help point out potential issues um, that might be good for you to, to review. And so they're listed in a way that hopefully is neutral enough that um, the intention is not to guide you to any kind of particular outcome, but just to sort of highlight specific spots where you might wanna look a little bit deeper and you might have additional questions to ask. So that was the, the thought. Got it, thank you. That's really helpful because I, I was um, wondering how to use this in the context of these and I wanted to make sure that I'm addressing it because the way that I read it was that there was um, some like there was something in particular with how this is currently written that is an issue that we need to address from an equity lens. And so your explanation is really helps me. So thank you. Um, and I'll just say that um, I'm very surprised that OCCA does not have something on here. And I, I, am, I very much think we need to have a policy on this matter. Um, I mean, you know, in terms of, um, especially when it comes to um, protecting survivors of um, any sort of, um, you know, form of abuse or form of, um, you know, being at, um, in a situation where there is unequal power or privilege dynamics. Um, I wanna make sure that we're protecting um, students. I wanna make sure we're protecting faculty and staff. Um, I definitely think we need to, to have a policy. And I agree with Mike around, um, maybe there needs to be some sort of discussion that we have with OCCDA to understand why that's not something that they are recommending to other community colleges as well. Okay, so Rosie, I saw you had your hand up, but put it down. Did you get your question answered? No, I didn't. I didn't know I put it down. I um, didn't hear my name mentioned, so I didn't know if I had successfully raised it. Yes. I still do have an observation I would Great. like to share. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Uh, this policy as written is to me not a policy. Um, it does not approve or prohibit uh, anything. It just says the president needs to pay attention to this and make sure that there's some sort of um, uh, procedures that are recognized. So I support eliminating this language and creating a policy that prohibits consensual relationships. I do think it's a liability, a vulnerability for the college. And it's irrelevant to me whether OCCA has a policy or doesn't have a policy. If we write one, we can always share it with them and they can add it to their library or not, but we need a policy. So I support um, Mike's uh, recommendation that we create policy and approve it. Okay, and so um, Michael Blade, did you have something you wanted to say in response or should I continue with um, board members? I just wanted to respond quickly to Chelsea in, in that uh, okay. the OCCA doesn't have a policy on consensual relationships. It has multiple policies on workplace violence, um, you know, sexual harassment, prohibition of harassment, uh, non-discrimination, things that touch on the results of a consensual relationship going, going badly. 
It just doesn't have anything specific on can an employee date another employee, can an employee date another date a student that's obviously of age. So I just wanted to make that clear that it does have policies on those things. Okay, thank you for that clarification. And so I have Matt Keating in the queue and followed by Angela. Thank you, Chair Fragola. Um, I, I actually do find some of the language very clear in this existing uh, board policy. Uh, quote, uh, he or she, which probably should read they, uh, exercises no supervisory or evaluative function over the other person in the relationship. That means an instructor provides an evaluative relationship over a potential student in a relationship. That's very clear to me. But there are dozens of uh, employees um, of various categories all throughout our campus who are, are married to or, or, or um, uh, to, to, to students uh, by virtue of the fact that there's an incentive for family members to take classes at Lane if you're an employee. Uh, that's, a, that's a good thing. Um, there, are, um, there are faculty and there are staff who are simultaneously students. And so I find it very problematic that we would want to explore a policy that tells two consenting adults who they uh, should or, or who they, uh, they, they, they can't be uh, engaged in a relationship with. I totally get the, the power dynamic conversation, and I think that's laid out pretty clearly, and I would be supportive of more clearly laying out a, 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 the power dynamic um, and more expressly indicating that uh, where, where that power dynamic exists, that that's wholly inappropriate. But I have no interest in an outright ban of relationships on campus. Angela? Thank you. Um, my comment was um, something similar, just in terms of, you know, folks come back to LCC for workplace retraining, implying they come back as adults, right? And, and certainly some of these we're also a large employer. So naturally it will happen that um, some students will come in already in relationships with an employee. And so I'm just not clear how that fits into this language. Obviously people don't have to end their relationships to come to OCC um, to take classes. But I assume that's obvious, but it's not obvious from the policy language. Hey, is there anyone else? Rosie. Doesn't the fact that you have a policy <clears throat> that speaks to the power dynamic uh, and, and prohibits that kind of consensual relationship give you then a platform for when those relationships don't end well, as Marge was saying at the beginning? It, the issue isn't the benign pre-existing relationships that are familial or whatever. The issue is the relationship that goes south and represents a liability for the college. So what I am advocating for is a policy that articulates a prohibition against that power dynamic um, that we've, that we've seen articulated here. So Mike, Mike is, that, is that the reason to have a policy? Yes, I mean, I, I, I totally get what um, both Angela and Matt were, were talking about. And I think we can craft a policy that, uh, you know, obviously exempts um, folks that are married uh, and, and probably can, can craft a policy that allows um, you know, folks that are already in a relationship when you've got an employee and a, and a student already in a relationship and the student wants to come, you know, back for reach, you know, career retraining or whatever, what have you, or just wants to take a class, even if they're not married. Um, I think this is really more focused on if you've got a, a employee and a student that aren't in a relationship starting up a relationship. Mike Eister? Yeah, I, in my first comment, I, I mentioned that this is a complex issue and it's been evolving for a long time. I can recall a U of O president who married one of his graduate students and 
thought that was just fine. And um, I think that Mike Blade has heard enough from us to get a gist of where we're at that uh, if he looks at some model policies um, that you could come back and propose something to us. And that's kind of seems like where we ought to go. Great, thanks for that summary, Mike. I So um, I was going to suggest that we will not be moving board policy 615 to the consent agenda at our board meeting. It sounds like, um, we are in agreement that it needs a lot of work and it needs some attention and possibly even um, conversation with OCCA and um, that it's a complex matter. I, will, I would like to recognize though that we have reviewed it so that when we are um, looking at our policy protocols and um, the things we need to do, um, this board policy has been um, reviewed, which is what, is that what you wanted to ask about, Angela? Okay, great. Um, so let's move on to board policy 625, gambling. Yes, this is another policy without a, without an OCCA policy. And, and I, you know, I think this is probably an issue that, um, uh, you know, some, a few, colleges are going to have a policy for and a lot of them probably aren't and that's probably why the OCCA didn't didn't focus on it um you know again this is this it's a very short policy basically prohibiting illegal gambling um and so I have no problem keeping this policy I don't think there's a whole lot of I if you wanted to get rid of it I wouldn't have much of a uh, heartburn over that either but um but that's there isn't anything in OCCA's policies that's even anywhere near this. So this is one we have to decide, do we want something about gambling or do we not? Or do we want, is there, a, is there something that needs to be tweaked here? I'm not seeing anything currently that I think needs tweaking, but that's why we're here. Okay, great. So I have Angela in the queue and followed by Matt Keating. I guess I'm confused why we have a policy about one specific illegal thing. Like, isn't all illegal stuff prohibited on LCC's campus? It's probably and a good story in there somewhere. <laughs> usually you get a policy after an incident, right? Um, but it does, it does strike me as, as unnecessary in the sense, like, yeah, if it's illegal, the, let's just say no to all illegal stuff and be done with it, right? Uh, let's see, Matt Keating's next. Yeah, since this, this was adopted in 98 and even last reviewed in 2016, there have been changes significantly to uh, Oregon's gambling laws. So I, I wonder, Michael Blade, um, uh, I, I wonder even if, if, if to Angela's point, I wonder if this is even even needed. Um, it's timely considering the Super Bowl is on Sunday, but it's it's uh, it's it seems a, a, a bit a bit much to even have a, a a policy that says something that is illegal is not welcome on campus. It makes no sense. Mike Eister. Uh, there was a time in the not too distant past that gambling was a national issue uh, among student affairs professionals who were very concerned about seeing a rise. I'm several years removed from that, so I have no idea what the current uh, situation is, but maybe our own student affairs staff currently could uh, advise us on that. But my guess is that this policy arose out of a specific need that was identified, not perhaps at uh, LCC specifically, but a national trend. Do you have any thoughts about whether or not we need to continue having it, Mike? Um, I would suggest that we check in with our current uh, student affairs staff who are more up to date than I am on where things are, uh, both nationally as well as at LCC. Marge? So I remember vividly when this became kind of hot, when you have places where people gather and you can have um, impromptu crap games, you can have uh, gambling for money, which could lead to violence. And potentially, you know, if you're in an urban city, it could even be gang violence. I've actually seen it. So 
I th- what I don't know, and Mike can can research this though, is will the current Oregon law protect us to say you cannot, you know, you, you walk into the cafeteria, you see a poker game going on, you see money flying back and forth. If the law protects us in Oregon, then we're good. We can just say it's illegal activity. I'm actually not up on that. Um, so Mike, you can check on that for us, if whether or not we need something beyond a state law. Yep, happy to do that. Okay. okay, anyone else? All right, so sounds like we're going to do a little more research on that one, but it has been reviewed to see if the law protects us. Um, and um, we, we might, it did sound like there was support for just removing it, but let's, let's go ahead and invest, investigate that first. I'm going to move us on to board policy 645, security of personal information. Right, and so, and so this one um, is interesting because uh, Lane's policy is, has, uh, talks a, a lot about different um, personal information, identity theft, um, personal data, student, and especially student financial transactions and, and educational records. OCCA doesn't have a single policy that that is as comprehensive as Lane's policy. It has three different policies that touch on each of these things. Uh, One being 3800, which talks about personal data protection. Now, that's a European Union uh, requirement. I don't know if we have any European students. If we do, then we'd be subject to that. so that's something we'd have to look into. I know, I know we've got international students and I would guess that some of them are probably from the European Union, but I don't know that for a fact. Um, there's the prevention of identity theft and student financial transactions, which, which dovetails well with parts of the Lane uh, policy. And then there's the educational records. That's, that has to do a lot with, um, with student privacy of their records and, and things like that. So uh, I think that, we probably need to have some of the language from 645 incorporated into an OCCA policy because I do think there's some important things in uh, 645, um, especially the reference to the, the ORS uh, sections. I think that would be, would, would be good to be in, in uh, the OCCA policies and it's not currently. So I, what I would like to see or what I would recommend is that we accept the three OCCA policies, but fold this one into one of them, whichever one we decide makes the most sense. Um, or maybe maybe what, we're do, maybe what we do is fold the parts of 645 that apply to the various OCCA policies into each one. Okay, I see Angela's hand. Angela, are you speaking? I was just chattering away. Uh, Sorry, you, you don't, it doesn't look like you're muted. And so that's why I didn't say anything, but we didn't hear, we didn't I'm hear. I'm never muted on the Zoom. I mute uh-huh. on my telephone. Okay, so. great. You want to start over? I'm secret muted or unmuted. Yes, <laughs> okay. My feelings on the subject are that the student record, um, language and the OCCA policy doesn't, I don't feel like that really gets that medical records. And since we do have medical records, I think that we need some more specific language in our policies. I know it references federal and state laws, but I would really like to see some very specific language about how we deal with medical records, which we currently have, um, and making sure that those are in compliance. Um, I, I just don't think that OCCA has written these policies thinking about schools with on-site medical services. And, and so I think that we need to think beyond that. Mike? Um, I, I thought about this during the, the previous conversation but didn't want to prolong it. But at some point, I would be curious to know if we have a HIPAA compliance officer 
or someone assigned that responsibility. Um, I, I don't, if we don't have one, I'm not sure how we're, it, it seems to me that we're pretty exposed and I don't expect an answer tonight, but I think that's something we need to address. March. So we definitely are addressing all these things. In addition, we called our insurance companies and we talked to them about what how large our policy was it's we have a million dollar policy and then we're shared you know in that larger occa pace group but when it comes to identity theft they're thinking of dropping it so um we might have to buy go out and buy this on our own what i prefer to do is bring this up at occa and find out what our liability you you know because you know you get better coverage through the larger group so we literally just found this out uh this week and we'll be looking into it. I think this is a, a great one to bring back to you all. Uh, I did talk to uh, Bill Schutz. He's got this information security incident response process. So, you know, he's, he's got prevention and a process. Um, I am also concerned we might not have enough liability coverage. So I think we'll investigate this, bring it back. And Angela, I hear uh, your concerns very uh, loud and clear, which is to make sure we add language about HIPAA and our medical records. So thank you. Um, anyone else have any thoughts on this board policy? Um, I, I'd like to say that I, I support um, legal counsel's recommendation of merging the two, of adopting the OCCA policy, but taking the more specific language um, and I would love to see this get worked on some more, um, you know, whether that's adopting the three OCCA policies and then taking the, the really detailed language in the LCC policy and integrating it. That actually seems like a more refined process to me that would be clearer. Um, and, you know, certainly adding that specific information um, about medical records. Anybody else have any final thoughts on this one? It sounds like we are going to send board policy 645 to be worked on, but we can mark that it's been reviewed. And I just did a real quick, uh, you know, I may have missed it, but I'm, I looked really quickly at the OCCA board policy to see if there was anything about medical records and I don't see anything in there. And that may just be because not everybody has a clinic and has medical records. So um, I'm going to put that on my list along with the, with the uh, consensual relationships to talk to Karen Smith about to see if they've done anything on medical records. Cause I'd rather not reinvent the wheel if they're working on it, but if not, then we may have to get that, you know, come up with that language ourselves. So Okay. Um, are we ready to go to the next? Yeah. Two? Yeah. Okay. Protection of immigrant students. Okay. So six six fifty is another um, equity lens. Uh, there is there is no uh, corresponding OCCA board policy. Now there are policies relating to protecting students. I don't want you guys to think there <laughs> there aren't any of those. There are, but there's nothing specifically related to protecting immigrant students. Um, I I'm not sure. Um, you know, what the, what the impetus of, of having this policy was, I'm wondering if it's related to DACA or something like that back uh, under the Obama administration and, and prior looking at the, the adoption date was 2017. So it could have been related to Trump, uh, to President Trump's attempts to get rid of DACA or, or at least limit it. I don't know, but that's probably why OCCA doesn't have its own uh, policy. And so I, my recommendation, unless there's something in, in this policy, and I like it actually, that you all want to change or get rid of, I, I think it's great. And I would keep it and renumber it. So um, I, I, did, I did actually um, cross-reference this with, I believe, a board resolution that was re related to protecting um, undocumented students from um, ICE or other um, raids, specifically um, at the same time that many sanctuary resolutions were being passed um, within our community. And um, I think this may have been 
Yeah. So any, anyway, they, they, they lined up pretty well. And I, I appreciate the language um, in, in this policy. I'm not sure if anybody was here when that resolution was passed. Rosie. Okay. Anyone else? All right, let's move on to LCC board policy 715 mandatory student activity fee. And much like the one we just did, this one doesn't have any specific uh, analog with OCCA policy. Um, again, I, now I, I, I do know that our uh, student government is, is working to have where the, you know, who decides what we, what they spend the fees on uh, change, but I don't know that anything um, other than the mandatory fee committee there, they're talking about what we're going to do with the mandatory fee committee. So it may be that this policy will, if if a change is made to that, we'll have to come back to, to the board to decide how we're going to adjust the policy. So I guess my, my uh, recommendation would be uh, maybe put this one on hold until that's decided, but I'm, again, await your instructions. Matt Keating? Yeah, th uh, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna go on record as uh, opposing this policy again. I opposed it in, in, uh, uh, when it was correct. Matt, you're, you're cutting in and out. So, okay. Um, so we're, we're not going to use the chat, um, but we did hear that you wanted to go on record that you're opposing this policy and that you opposed it when it was first implemented. Is that correct? I'm going to move on to Mike Eister. Yeah. Um, it seems to me that the policy is pretty important to ensure that students have the ability to raise money to do the things that they want to do and that they have uh, control over that. I will say that having worked at the university for 25 years, uh, that we need to be careful about putting bumpers on it because uh, at, at U of O that, some, that, that fund has gotten very big uh, and um, it, it just gets, it can get out of control if, if you're not careful about it. My preference is to keep the policy in place. And if this committee makes a recommendation uh, that causes us to think we should change the policy to change it at that time. But in the meantime, I think we should keep the current policy in place. Okay, anyone else? Matt, did you figure out your technical difficulties? You want to try again? Not hearing anything. Okay. Um, Chelsea Jennings. Thank you. Um, I appreciate um, Mike Eister's um, comments and having that come from, you know, his prior experience. And I, you know, I am not necessarily in favor of putting additional fees onto students um, because the cost of education, I think from a general standpoint can be very expensive. But in terms of this policy, as it's currently written, I mean, there's elements of it that I like in terms of the fact that, you know, there's um, proclamations in here around, you know, establishing a mandatory fee committee. Um, there's, um, you know, language in here about um, us approving an assessment of mandatory fees, um, you know, based on, you know, educational value and um, language in here about us, you know, and basically like having that, like having us as a board, like need to review it and see it. Um, so I like the, the language in this policy around making sure that, you know, as, as much as I don't like the idea necessarily of, you know, more additional student fees, I like the language in this policy around putting provisions around it and making sure that 
we have committees having their eyes on it. We have um, the board looking at these things. So um, there's a, an equity part of this in terms of, you know, if we're, go if we're gonna have fees like this, I, I like the language that's in here in terms of making sure that we're assessing these fees and that there's students involved and that's an equitable process for making sure that we're assessing these sort of fees in as equitable of a way as possible. Thank you. Um, Matt, sounds like you you got reconnected by your phone. Did you want to go ahead? Yeah, thank, thanks, Chair Fragula. Um, I just wanted to rec uh, make clear that I didn't support this policy in the beginning uh, when it was first created. I didn't support the transition uh, moving away from uh, student elected um, uh, a fee structure. I understand why it's in place, uh, but I was most concerned and remain concerned about the historic um, reason why certain clubs on campus uh, and, and uh, receive a, a certain threshold of activities fee. And uh, on a largely transient campus, uh, if there's every, every year, two years, three years, there's a new student population that goes back to the drawing board, uh, then some of that historical institutional knowledge um, isn't passed on. And, and, and so I would be supportive of language that, that locks, it, locks in uh, the work that students did uh, democratically on campus to get their student activities fees where they're at. Um, and I hope that that helps inform the president's ap appointed uh, student activities fee committee. But I, this, the, the, the transition never sat well with me and this particular policy um, uh, is, uh, I find it, I, I wanna protect the students activities fees and I wanna protect the autonomy uh, that the students had at the time democratically when they uh, voted in uh, a certain threshold of, of their fees. And I hope that this institution uh, continues to protect those very same clubs and programs uh, that, that receive student activities fees and fund nine fees. Thank you very much for that clarification, Matt. And I apologize if I misrepresented you earlier. Um, Marge, Dr. Hamilton. Yeah, we would be happy to bring this back for a second look because right now it is an issue uh, on campus. Uh, there are a group of students who are challenging the committee, having an out, a committee external to student government. They came to me about this. Um, I asked them to deal with it within their own structure first and then come back. Uh, Mike will be involved. There's a lawsuit that goes back a couple of years. I'm gonna imagine Matt, you might have been here, Rosie, during that. Um, I have not had the opportunity to read that case or what happened. So we have, I want to do a little due diligence on that before we bring it back for you again. Okay. Anyone else? So I, I'm assuming that when we talk about researching and, and reporting back and um, reassessing a board policy, we're keeping that board policy in place so that we don't have a vacuum or an absence of something in the meantime? Right. Okay, thank you. All right, that was the last one. Awesome, Angela. And you said it about all the others, Lisa, but just again, confirming that we are going to mark that we reviewed it. Yes. So we get credit. Reviewed yes. Every time. <laughs> we have reviewed these seven board policies that um, were approaching the um, over ripeness of their expiration date. And um, I noted that um, board policy 615 needs work. Board policy 625 and 715 are going to be researched and reported back on. Um, and it sounded like the other three board, um, the other three board policy 645 also needs some work and com comes back to us, but the other three we may see on our consent agenda. It didn't seem like there were any concerns there. Okay, great. So that 
is our last discussion item for the evening. Um, our next board meeting is the third week of um, February on February 17th. Um, I am going to continue to remind you that we have interviews on February 27th for appointing someone to zone one. Um, and other than that, if, if, unless there's any um, good of the order, um, comments or thoughts, I will adjourn us. Okay, great. So we are adjourned.